All right. Good afternoon. Thank you all again so much for being online and joining me today for the webinar. Uh, you are in a webinar format as opposed to a Zoom class which is um, basically all you need to know is you don't need to check in. Uh, this is not for CE credit. It's just about an hour and a half-ish of informational uh, presentation. So you'll just be seeing me. I don't need to see you, and that's just fine. If you have any questions during the session, just use the chat feature to type those in there. I'll do my best to keep my eye on it and try to answer them in, uh, as quickly as I possibly can uh, during the presentation. My contact information is also on the screen right now, so feel free to jot that down, take a picture. Uh, I am a full-time employee at HAR, so this is kind of what I do. If you have any questions, uh, you are welcome to email or call. I can't do your CMAs for you, um, but I'm glad to um, look, give you a second eye, a set of eyes to look it over. I give you some advice along the way, reiterate what uh, we talk about today. Today is just an overview, so it's going to move fairly quickly and just kind of give you some uh, basic, what I call cookie cutter facts about the process of a CMA. And then uh, it is going to be posted, if you didn't see that message already in the chat, uh, it will be uh, recorded and then posted to our playlist of webinars that we have on our HAR TV, uh, YouTube TV channel. Um, youtube.com slash HARTV is the web address for that. I'll also try to send an email to everyone to let you know that it's posted. So if you registered, um, I will have your email address and I'll just send you an email to let you know that the, the recording's gone live whenever that happens. Uh, it just takes it a while to render and to get edited and then get posted, but it's usually just within a couple, a couple of days. All right, so those are all kind of my announcements to begin with. Again, the Webinar's focus today is mostly the CMA products, but I know that you'll probably want an overview of how to get your comp, so I'm going to throw that in there. So we will be covering uh, sort of what makes a good comp and what doesn't, um, an overview of the instant CMA, the CMA wizard, the quick CMA, and then the cloud CMA product. And the cloud CMA product is the only one that it requires a platinum subscription. You have to be subscribed to the HAR MLS platinum set of tools to use cloud. Just very quickly, the difference kind of between all of those, the instant CMA is the shortest and sweetest, which is kind of intuitive from the name of it. It's very instant. Um, it is embedded into the property detail pages on Matrix. It's also in the HAR app. So it's one of those that's really quickly and easily available just right at your fingertips. Uh, again, we'll show you those here in just a moment. The quick CMA, though it's third on the list there, would probably be the second in terms of uh, the, the fastest to put together and uh, kind of the shortest, sweetest output. Neither of these has a lot of information, but they have all of the good basic math that you need to um, guesstimate uh, and figure out uh, a list price range to give to a consumer. The CMA wizard is gonna have about 20 some pages to its CMA, so, uh, excuse me, to its CMA template. So it's gonna have charts, graphs, a columnar comparison, some photos of the comps that you choose, a place where you can upload the photo of the subject property. Uh, again, math is math. So all of these products have the same type of math and are done about the same way in terms of the factoring of the suggested list price range. But the matrix CMA has a lot more pages, fluff in a good way, uh, support for the math that you're doing and presenting to that consumer. And then last but not least, the cloud CMA, it has uh, 50 some pages to its template. It's about, um, it's very similar to the CMA wizard or the matrix CMA wizard. Uh, but it's just much more customizable. You can change the font. You can change the color of the font. Um, they have many layouts of different types of pages from the column or comparison to three up per comp and um, things like that. So again, if you are subscribed to the Platinum Package of Tools, you will have access to that cloud CMA product in addition to everything that all members already have an access to um, in the matrix. All right, so let's get rolling on looking at some of these things. So kind of the first step to doing a CMA is to collect all the information that you can on the subject property. So well, I've already gone into matrix tax to pull up my property. Uh, and just pretending that this home is, um, the, the homeowner has contacted me. 
and is interested in listing their home. Uh, again, I've just gone into matrix tax. There's nothing wrong with using realist tax. I just have to pick one. So I pick matrix tax. I tend to lean toward matrix tax just because it looks the most like matrix MLS. It flows naturally to me. And uh, again, that just is my, my personal go-to, but you certainly could use either. And on the criteria, I just simply put the street number and street name. I didn't put anything else in there. If you put drive court, street lane, avenue, those kinds of things, sometimes it just confuses the system rather than being able to find that property. So looking at the results, I'm gonna click on the parcel ID or tax ID for that particular property. And then that will allow me to collect some good information. One presumes also that the owner has reached out to you in some way and requested that you do this CMA. So they've called you, emailed, text, filled out a form online, whatever it might be. So you can use the owner as a resource of information as well. Ask them if they've done updates, uh, get the a, kind of generic um, shape, size, age, condition of their home by having that conversation with them. The tax records will show us the shape and size and age, but it can't tell us about the condition. So that's a really good conversation to have with the owner of the property. And then looking at the property detail page, again, we're gonna learn a lot about the home uh, that we can use to run our comps. So looking at the location information section here, we've got the uh, geo market or market area of Spring Northeast for this particular property. It's in MLS area number 15. If you use those, if you're familiar with those as all, at all, um, I think the MLS areas rather than the area number are gonna be a little more intuitive. So I would lean toward using that if you wanted to use uh, one of those too. Uh, again, it gives me the subdivision name a little further up. I've got that it's in Spring, Texas, the zip code that it falls in. So plenty of geographic parameters to use to search for comps. When you're searching for a comp, what you're looking for is homes that are about the same shape, size, age, condition, in as similar a uh, geographic area as possible. So again, we're gonna pull these details from the tax record and then potentially that conversation that we had with the owner and build a search based around that same criteria, All right? A little further down in the page, about two thirds the way down, you get the characteristics of the home. So here again is where we'll find the lot size, the home square footage, uh, the number of bedrooms, baths, stories, uh, the year it was built. So again, really great um, cookie cutter fact as I call it, about the home to begin building that search, All right? Back up toward the top, there's also tabs for the last known listing in MLS. So if this property had been in MLS before, it's a really good idea to go look at that previous listing. And that way you could see uh, pictures, read about the property. This one sold way back in ancient real estate times. So the sale happened a long time ago, but it would give me, excuse me, an opportunity to look at some photos about what the um, layout was. Uh, and then it gives me good information to ask the owner about. Okay, I'm seeing photos here from 2006 or whatever it was. Did it have to look like that? If they've made updates since they purchased the home, knowing what those were and what it looks like now can be really helpful. And again, you can kind of get an idea of those um, things to ask about from the photos. If we look at the kitchen in this particular property, it's a perfectly functional kitchen. And this photo again is from several years ago when the home was first purchased. Um, it's not an updated kitchen, right? It's functional and it's, it's just fine in terms of uh, it working and acting as a kitchen. But is it the latest, greatest appliances and the newest finishes? Certainly not. So if I'm looking at comps in the area, that all do have updated kitchens. Well, this particular property just simply can't compete on that same level. You know, I use um, fruit, apples to apples. You've all heard that term potentially. So it, it, I'm looking for an apple to apple comparison. This one's an apple and an orange type comparison. If the comps are all more updated and uh, just look a little newer and shinier and stiffed up, well, Mr. Drew either can't quite compete on that level and will never be able to sell his property at the same price that those others are selling for, or he needs to make some upgrades or updates to the home in order to become com more competitive. All right. So again, the previous listing can really help a lot. It opens the conversation, if nothing else, with the owner. Looking down in the remarks section, again, this one sold quite a while ago, but um, all new air conditioner in 2002, water heater, paint, carpet, roof, all sorts of great things happened back in 2002, 
but that's ancient real estate history now, as I called it a moment ago. So this again is a good conversation starter. What condition is the air conditioner in now? What condition is the water heater in now? Have those been replaced since you've lived there? Um, if not, are you going to replace those? Is that a condition of the sale? Are you selling everything as is? So again, these conversation starters, as I call them, uh, can easily be found usually in the MLS. Unfortunately, not all remarks are as insightful or as helpful as some others. Uh, but again, just kind of keep in mind that you're trying to get the most information that you can. If that conversation happens with the owner, as opposed to finding it in written information in a previous listing or on the tax record, that's great. Whatever resource you can use or source that you have to get in that information, then you would be good to get it. That's all you need is just to get it. It doesn't matter which resource that you use. And a question in the chat asking about um, the house type numbers when we're looking at the tax record. Uh, I wish I could speak to that a little bit better, Charles. I'm not really certain what um, the one, two, three, and four in the uh, appraisal district classification actually means. I apologize. Uh, now I have some homework. I can't not know the answer to these questions. So I just don't know what the answer is now, but I will research that and see if I can't figure that out and send it to you by email. All right, thanks for the question. Even though I apologize, I can't give you an answer right this moment. You always have good questions for me, Charles. Thank you. All right, so presuming that we've done our homework and research on the subject property, Uh, yes, those numbers are on the tax record somewhere, but I just, again, just don't know what they mean. Sorry. All right, so looking at um, matrix MLS now, I've, again, already gone ahead and uh, done some pre-searching um, to get us into um, the process of doing the output of a CMA. Again, the primary focus of the webinar isn't to collect the comps, but you got to know how to do that in order to get an uh, generate a CMA. So I decided to cover that, of course. So looking at my results here, I've already picked my results. So um, just to kind of go through again why I picked what I picked uh, about the same shape, size, age, uh, condition. Again, looking at your photos, reading the remarks in the listings, uh, looking at the results on a map. All of those will help you kind of find the comp that would work the best. Um, you're looking for uh, something that's about the same lot size and about the same square footage as your subject property. And then again, you want to look through those photos and see which ones look about the same shape and size. That previous listing can help tremendously. Hopefully, there was a previous listing and that makes it easy for you to see, again, photos and things like that. And yes, I am going into how I searched for these and what I did to get here. <clears throat> so I went ahead and filled in some basics. Oh, again, I call them cookie cutter facts about the home. You're generally always going to want to search in your active pendings and solds. Generally speaking, when you click on the sold status initially, it's going to put a 0 180 in this box. I went back further than that just because I wanted to show you all plenty uh, and have some examples of some other information that I wanted to share with you. But generally speaking, you want to stay in a little bit tighter date range than that. The more recently it sold, the more relevant it is to the current market. The current market in pretty much every market right now is crazy. Everything is moving very quickly. So if there's inventory, then it sells quite quickly is kind of um, typical for uh, the greater Houston area right now. So. Again, do as I say, not as I do. I'm trying to give you visual examples, so I went back way further than I would need to. Hopefully, you wouldn't need to go back a whole year. Uh, 180 days, again, it would automatically put that 0 180 there. That's about six months, and your goal is generally uh, the past three to six months. So um, that, again, is fine to leave it at that 0 180, all right? And then looking at my tax record, again, I left it open here just so that we could refer back to it. If you'll recall, the building square footage was 1,660 square feet. So I put in a range that was going to capture anything that was um, about 1,660 with a little bit above and a little bit below 1,660. If you look at just 1,660 square feet, you could be missing that 
perfect gem of a comp that was 1,661 square feet. Now there are several different schools of thought on this. Um, some do 250 square feet above and below the subject property. Some do 500, some do uh, a percentage, you know, 3%, 5%, 10%, whatever it is that you wanna do. It matters, but hear me when I say, hear me out. It doesn't matter so much where you search. It doesn't matter how wide that range is as much as it matters what you choose in the end. So I can search in this kind of wide uh, property uh, square footage range, but what I'm gonna pick is something that is as similar as possible to the subject. So I could have a range of results, but I only pick those that have as close as possible to the 1,660 square feet of my subject property. Same thing with year built. Uh, this is a little subjective as well. Year built, uh, generally speaking, the older the home, the wider that range could be, the newer the home, the tighter that range needs to be. Now, old is subject, subjective. Um, I was built in 1972, so I don't think this home in 1970, built in 1975 is all that old by years, but in terms of a house, it's old, right? Um, they only had brick, uh, wood, concrete, you know, there weren't big fancy uh, synthetic stuccos and uh, all that type of thing to build a home with in the mid 70s. So if he's not made any upgrades or the upgrades weren't previously made to this home, it's a little vintage. So I'm going to need to search again in about that same year built range, but I have some flexibility there because it was built back in the 70s. I did as big a swing as, you know, 10 years above and below that because again, I could pick a home that was built in 1979 or 1980 and it might be similar enough to compare to his. Right. Uh, looking at the chat here, would it be a good idea to check for renovations before using a date parameter? Uh, yes, it, it, yes and no. You want to ask the um, homeowner of your subject property what updates or renovations, uh, changes to the home have been done. And then if you search in um, Matrix, you're still going to build it this way because even though they may have updated it two or three years ago, the home was still built in the year it was built in, right? Even if they did some major renovations, um, the home was still technically built. The slab, the frame, and you know, all of those things were um, had existed since, in this case, 75, right? Again, once we do the range of searching for potential comps, we can then just be sure to pick those that are as much like the subject. So if our subject did have some renovations and updates, then we're looking for comps that have those as well, right? Absolutely, thank you for your question. All right, so moving on into, uh, again, the property details. I just did a basic three or more bedrooms, two or more bath, because that's what he has in his subject property. He has three bedrooms, two and a half bath. And so I just put full only, so I did two and up. And then one story only because his home was one story and he did not have a pool. Again, I got most all that information from the tax record. Uh, my fake conversation, my hypothetical conversation with the owner and or uh, the previous listing MLS in MLS. So moving on down to our geography, there's several different ways that you can search in geography. Again, just kind of flipping back over to that tax record. Remember we had uh, zip codes, we have the legal description, we have the subdivision name, we have city, zip, MLS area number, geo market area. Again, market area, I think is more um, efficient, more helpful. Uh, the one that I would suggest you use over ML number. Uh, again, township or city name, uh, spring. So lots of different things I could use there um, to fill in the blanks. So zip codes or subdivision name. If you're gonna use the zip, uh, subdivision name, one little friend that you might wanna know about if you don't already know about it is the asterisk. So if I were to put oak, asterisk, ridge, asterisk, I'm telling it anything that starts with oak then could have a space or no space or another word, that asterisk is just saying, and something else could be right here. And then it would have the word ridge. So again, by narrowing it to a certain subdivision or geo market area and or subdivision, um, that's going to help me find things that are as similar as possible geographically. Now, subdivision could get a little too small. His neighborhood, Oak Ridge North A, technically was his subdivision, and that's just a tiny little pocket of about 12 homes. There's just hardly anything in there. 
Um, so I would need to maybe go a little broader in my geography. But this gets me started. If you'll notice in the lower left corner, I have nine matches. So that would be an okay place to start. NAR says uh, that they would like you to try to have three actives, three of some form of pending, and three solds. What is weighted most heavily or what counts the most is solds. That's what the market really did do and could accomplish. So even if you can only find one good solid comp, it's way better to have one good solid sold comp instead of three mediocre ones. So always go for quality over quantity, but we're trying to get a range, right? We're trying to get a suggested list price range that we give to that consumer. And there's just not a lot of leeway. You're not gonna get a lot of swing or flexibility in a range if you only have one sold. So you might need to go back up and edit some of your parameters. Again, I went back up to a year just to show you extra information that I wanna be able to show you, but you might need to do that in real life too. What I would probably do, the order I would do them in, again, this is just my humble personal opinion. I don't wanna change the shape and size of the house parameters all that much because that is what it is, right? The house isn't gonna uh, get bigger or smaller. And so looking for comps that are too much bigger or too much smaller isn't going to benefit me all that much. So instead of going back the 180 days that it's um, defaulting to, again, that's about six months. So then maybe I would creep back seven months and then maybe eight. Um, again, too much further back in time, you're getting into apples and oranges because the market was just so different eight, nine, ten months ago. That's not going to benefit you. All right. So again, my humble personal opinion is seven, eight months back is about as far as I would go. And I, I don't know about you, but I can't really calculate that in this manner. I can't do zero dash, however many days, eight months would be. You can click this little icon next to that field. That's a little calendar. So you can just simply scroll back in time and go through uh, the dates. Oops, sorry, I went back two years instead of two months. So again, you can just kind of creep back that way and just click the date on the calendar and it'll put it into that field for you. Right, so uh, whatever works for you in that. And then the next thing I would change probably is my uh, geography. Oak Ridge, again, is a tiny little pocket up in the Woodland Spring area, so that may be too small to find adequate comps. So maybe then I change to uh, just zip codes, just the geo market, uh, Spring, Texas. Uh, the other option that you can do, which I've already done on the map, is looking by map. So if you click on the map tab, Across the top, you've got your drawing tools where you can draw a circle, a rectangle, a polygon, or a freehand polygon. And I just went ahead and made a polygon that kind of followed I-45 because I just happen to know the homes or the properties to the west of I-45 versus those on the east of I-45 are just really different. On the west side of 45, they tend to be a little bit smaller lots, a little bit newer homes, newer meaning built in the 80s and 90s um, and some new construction as opposed to these that were built more in the 70s and the age range that I need to look for. Um, again, if you know the area fairly well, you can narrow it down pretty easily by the uh, drawing tools. I removed all geography from my criteria. They're working in conjunction with each other. So if I had written our left subdivision in that field and then went to draw on the map, I never would get any further than subdivision because subdivision in the text fields combined with what I drew on the map, subdivision is canceling out what I drew on the map. So just be mindful of that. Sometimes it's better just to take out all of the geographical criteria and use a shape instead. <clears throat> Pardon me. So just to show you how to draw the polygon, <laughs> me. just to show you how to draw the polygon, if you click on any one of the tools, frankly, click, it'll highlight it in yellow so you know that that tool is selected and you're ready to go. And then I just clicked and let go, click and let go, click and let go every time you want to change direction. And I'm just drawing some random shape over here just to show you how the tool works, All right? And then you either meet back up with the first point or double click to let it know that you're done. And it will then search for property, excuse me, in that particular shape, <clears throat> all right? Again, I don't have anything because my criteria that I typed and the shape on the map just kind of canceling out each other. I'm also looking in places that aren't really developed and uh, aren't really a neighborhood. So again, just do as I say, not as I do. Uh, don't draw random shapes in the middle of nowhere. Um, the circle tool, uh, 
would be probably my last resort in terms of tools I would use. I would use the um, polygon or the freehand polygon. The freehand polygon is just a little bit smoother line where you can not have to click and let go and still draw whatever shape it is you need. Right, again, just showing you functionality here, not a practical place to draw my shape. Lastly, that circle or radius, uh, an appraiser can go out as far as two and a half miles away from the subject property in any direction. Again, if I were to draw a circle, uh, I typed the subject property address in this little box in the upper right, so it pinned it on the map for me. So let me zoom way in here. It's a little hard to see because there's a sold right by it. But if you see this kind of differently shaped pen on the map, that's actually 310 Crossbow. And I can tell that one of my solds is right across the street. So that's great. Uh, it'll come in handy a little bit later. Um, if you were to then pick up the circle tool, go as close as possible to the tip of that little pin where we know the property is and drag it out. Again, you could go out as far as two and a half miles. Two and a half miles in every direction is a crazy big long way to go, especially given how different every single neighborhood is in the greater Houston area. Uh, you may find some other sold comps that could be good. Just be really certain that you're looking at all those characteristics. Again, if I were to look at these properties that are on the west side of 45, they're probably going to be much smaller lots, maybe newer uh, built homes, things like that. So uh, make sure that it's a benefit to you to draw the shape and find the results. It's not a matter of finding a lot of results. It's a matter of finding a lot of good comps or as many good comps as we can, right? So again, I would use the circle list if I had to do that. And I have a question in the chat about how uh, about opening two matrix windows at a time. You can. Uh, you may have noticed that I already did that. If you hover on something in matrix like I did the public records a moment ago. So I would right click on the matrix tax if that's what I wanted to open. And then you can just choose add in, I mean, open in a new tab or new window. And it will let you open several different windows of matrix. Eventually it'll get a little frustrated and say, ah, you can't do that. You've got too many windows open. I can't keep track of all of these, but you can generally do two, three, four, and it's happy and it won't time out on you. Now, if you were to go all the way back to the HAR page and click the button to enter matrix again, it will not let you do that. So just be mindful of that. You just hover on whatever it is you need to open and then right click and choose open in a new tab or new window. And it'll be happy. It'll work that way for you. All right. Thank you, Debbie, for that question as well. All right, so moving on, again, pretending that I have found my amazing, perfect, wonderful comps. I've painstakingly read through these. Uh, again, look at the photos, read the remarks. Uh, you're looking for something that's the same in shape and size and condition. Your apples to apples uh, as best as you can. I took the time to just pick them already so that we don't have to worry about y'all watching me read all those. So just do as I say, not as I do. All right. Um, and then we have our output, things that we can now do to generate our CMA. Again, the mile radius search uh, in MLS, I, I would only do that if all of the other things that I had tried didn't work out for me. It's a good tool, but it can sometimes be a little too broad because two, up to two and a half miles in any direction can be um, very different geographically. So while I might find some solds in that radius search, they may not be um, relevant at all or good comps in terms of things I'd pick. And yes, you can do two MLS searches in a new tab each time. I just happen to have tax in MLS search open, but you can do two different searches. Like if somebody called me right now and needed me to do a rental search, then I could just real quickly pop over and do that. And it's what I have started with in one window and I pick up right where I left off. All right, so looking at again why I chose active and pending, there's a question in the chat about that. Um, again, the recommendation is to try to find some actives and pendings and solds. The solds are where the math is going to come from. So again, if you don't have any, that's okay. The reason that I would choose actives is because that's my current competition, right? And um, just kind of half jokingly, I always call it nosy neighbor syndrome, right? 
the owner of this subject property is likely going to know that his neighbor has his home on the market for X number of dollars, uh, maybe even what the home looks like if they're friends or neighbors or, you know, in cl close proximity to each other, they may know about that other property. And so I want to be able to speak on those educatedly. Also, that's what the market's doing right now. So that's a current reflection, excuse me, of the market. So um, again, if it's about the same, same shape, size, um, age, etc. I can show them the condition of these properties. In this particular neighborhood, there were no comps that were not updated. So Mr. Drew is going to either have to step it up and update his home a little bit or just understand that he cannot achieve what the rest of the market is going to be able to achieve right now because his home simply is an orange, an apple, and the rest of the market is full of oranges, right? It's nothing wrong with either fruit or either house, it's just not um, a good comparative uh, in terms of the sold price that that house is able to achieve once it's all updated, which is which is not yet updated. All right, and then pendings show you the trend of that particular market. Though we don't know the amount of the offer, we do know that some buyer came, some buyer put in an offer, and that seller has accepted that offer and they're working it out to end up closing on that particular property, right? They're in the process of doing that. They're in that um, either in this case, final stage of pending or in their, they're in their option period, uh, or maybe pending continue to show a little further along in the pending process. So that is showing us the trends that homes priced at X are bringing buyers, are receiving offers, and hopefully we would be able to do the same, all right? Again, if you choose not to pick actives and pendings, that's okay. Uh, the sold is, uh, the sold, again, is where your math is going to come from to generate the projected or um, suggested list price. But again, I think it's a good idea to show the competition and current trends in that particular market. So I usually always throw in actives and pendings. When we do the math here in a moment using the quick CMA, it doesn't factor in the actives and pendings. It only does the math based on the solds. So again, they are just mostly for showing an example as you do the CMA. All right. I'm going to look at my chat here again. I've got a couple of other options. Another question. What's the quickest way to see a saved cart when you first go into matrix? Um, that would be back on the home page. There's a little widget for that. If you go to my matrix, there's a widget for your carts there, and you could open the cart there. Um, can we pull the comps that HCAD used last to justify the market value for the taxes? Um, you could do a tax search and find homes that are about the same shape and size, uh, but you won't necessarily know what homes um, HCAD or whatever CAD it is used to determine their tax evaluation, if any. Um, so you could do sort of a tax CMA instead of a MLS CMA. Again, it's only going to give you tax value, which isn't necessarily a current reflex, a reflection of the current market. Again, things are selling like crazy right now. Um, there's multiple offers, like 20, 30, 40 multiple offers. So things are uh, trending to sell way over a list right now. So though your um, tax value, that's what they're paying taxes on, could give you a good ballpark. Our current real estate market could potentially show numbers that are much higher than that. So it's a good place to start, but I would not use that as your final CMA, right? Um, if you're trying to help someone um, lower their taxes, protest their taxes, then running those types of uh, CMA-esque type search in just the tax record um, area would be a really good idea, Charles. All right, so a couple of different reasons why you would do that. But again, if we're trying to do it for a suggested list price, it would be just a good place to start, but not where I end up. That's my final CMA. All right, so again, just pretending I've painstakingly read through all of these. Y'all just have to trust me. These are the best of the comps uh, that I could find for the subject property here. One of the things that I wanted to show you, which is why I went back a little further in time than I typically would, is the um, archive report. So on the very far right side, the DOM column, that stands for days on market, all right? The DOM actually is just how long it's had the most current MLS number. It's not really how long it's been on the market, particularly if it's got a little asterisk like the one I highlighted. The DOM versus the CDOM can sometimes be really important in a CMA. If you see a trend uh, as you do your search, look at your results. If you see that a bunch of those results have asterisks, then that's telling you there's more to the story. 
if we look at the archive report for this one that has 21 days on the market, the little clock just to the left of the MLS number shows you how uh, how it has spent its time in MLS, hence the, the clock, a little kind of cute way for me to remember that. If you click there, you will see that it's been on the market with the current MLS number for 21 days, but really it's been sitting there and not selling for 76. Again, if you notice that a bunch of homes in your results, uh, the majority of them have asterisks and therefore a CDOM number, then that's going to show you that that market as a whole, there's a trend in that market that homes are sitting and not selling as quickly as they could have potentially in some other market or they might be in other markets. So the reason that it sits there, we don't know. It could be condition. It could be because the seller's stubborn. It could be because the market just can't handle a listing like that right now. Again, I don't think you're going to see that a lot in the current market conditions, given that inventory is so low and things are moving so quickly on average uh, around the greater Houston area. But this is really important to know. Again, we know the what. We know it's actually been on the market 76 days and not sold. So I would look harder at the pictures, read those remarks, maybe even reach out to the, um, selling, uh, the listing agent and see what the situation might be if they'll tell us that. All right. So um, just keep that in mind. Again, on mine, when I'm looking at my results, I just have three properties and um, those probably aren't really going to be that big a deal. It turns out that one of them was a, uh, an OK comp that I chose, but the other two that have the asterisks weren't for other reasons. So I just didn't choose those. Again, if you click that little clock just to investigate three days with the current MLS number versus actually being on the market for over a hundred for a hundred days, it can make a really big difference. If again you see a bunch of those, then you need to take that in consideration. Where did they all actually sell? Um, again, investigate the best you can with your remarks at MLS. Um, photos of the property and things like that and see if you can figure out the why. Even if it's already sold, reaching out to that listing agent and seeing if you can get a little bit more information could be of help, right? So where my property falls in terms of suggested list price range could shift a little depending on how long uh, the rest of the market has sat on the market, all right? Moving on. Pretending again that I have painstakingly read through all of these. I've picked the most important, amazing, perfect comps that I possibly could. I'm then going to start then with the quick CMA. So, um, Wanda, I will try to work that in. It's not necessarily part of the CMA, but I'll try to work in uh, labels if I can toward the end of this webinar just to, be, to, to try to cover that for you. Uh, and then where did I click again to get the actual days? So the DOM column in the far right is showing you how many days it's had the current MLS number. And then to get that CDOM or cumulative days, I clicked this little clock icon. It's like a good old fashioned alarm clock with little bells and hands and all of that. And I'll zoom in a little so you can make it out a little bit better. It's just to the left of the MLS number. And uh, it says property archive when you have a lot of it. All right. So looking down at the bottom again, the quick CMA is next is the first thing I'm going to talk about in terms of getting output for a CMA. It's one of the shorter, sweeter um, CMA reports. So clicking there again, depending on how many comps you pick, maybe two or three pages. It's perfectly fine to give to a consumer in terms of um, presentation. You would want to be able to talk educatedly about why you chose these comps. Um, the, the math, what we're going to talk about here in a minute, you will, you will have to be able to articulate that and explain um, what it is that you, why you chose what you chose and how that math works out. Uh, looking a little further down the page, it's breaking it up into statuses. So all my actives are grouped together, then whatever forms of pending would each have their own table. And then last but not least, all the solds are in their own table. And I mentioned a little earlier that the sold uh, properties are the ones that are weighted most heavily. If we move on into page two, my solds overflow just a little, but you've got your average, minimum, maximum, average, and median numbers in all of those statuses. Down at the very bottom is a quick statistic summary, and that's generally what I use to do the math, and this will be a little convoluted to get it too deep into for this particular webinar, but again, feel free to email or uh, reach out to me after the webinar, and I'll be glad to send you a little further explanation of the math that I'm about to talk about. 
All right. So looking at my sales price per square foot, as opposed to my adjusted sale price per square foot, I generally always focus on the average number because that's going to factor in my lows and my highs and my middle numbers, mid-range um, mid numbers. Median is just the middle of a list, no math involved at all. So that one's not necessarily what I really want. This one is focusing on all the properties that I chose after I did all that painstaking research. So that's going to be more all-encompassing, all right? So I would then take this sales price per square foot or the adjusted price per square foot. And let me talk about what the difference between those two numbers is uh, for a moment. My numbers aren't any different, I realize. I didn't have any adjustments that were made on the properties. Let me just go back to my sold list real quickly and show you uh, an example of where an adjustment would come from. Again, I'm just going to pick this property because I know it has an adjustment. It's not one of my comps, though. So again, it didn't factor into my math. But if you open the detail page of a sold and scroll all the way down to the bottom, uh, almost the very last line of that is seller contribution to buyer closing costs and actual repairs made. If they have numbers there, then that number is your adjustment. Those two things are really the only thing that is adjusted for. Again, on the quick CMA, it would do the math already. So if I had chosen this as a comp, it would have already adjusted for that extra $4,000 that they had to give away. That's a concession, right? They had to give $4,000 to make that deal work. This is another instance that if you see a bunch of concessions like this being made, if all of your solds had some sort of contribution to closing costs or um, actual repairs made, then that is telling you that that market required that those adjustments be made or th things wouldn't sell, right? If I'm only seeing it on one or two, which again, in my whole list of comps, I only had two properties that had any adjustments, none of which were homes that I chose as comps because they didn't fit the bill any other way. So that is not a trend in that market. That just happens to be on this particular scenario between the buyer and seller, a little concession needed to be made by the seller in order for that buyer to be happy and for that particular home to sell, all right? So again, do your research there. Just open each of your solds that you choose by clicking that MLS number and just seeing if any concessions were made. Again, I can tell easily that nothing needed to be, that there were no adjustments because this number and this number are the same, All right? Let me go back to my um, questions here. Is, a way, is there a way to change the headers? I think um, your question, Sharva, if I, Sharva, I think it says Michael Eyes or Sabata, sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, I think you were on, uh, it popped up when I was looking at this particular page. You can insert columns on the results page. If you just kind of get your mouse in that gray area next to the name of a column and click once, you'll get the uh, insert column option. And I often do insert the C-D-O-M column just so I don't have to keep opening and closing archive reports. Find the column name you want, click apply, and then it just added that CDOM column next to. So um, I think that was, uh, I saw that pop up before I went to my, res, um, my CMA. So let me know if that's not your question there. And then is it more important to calculate based on square footage or sale price? Oh, good. You're welcome, Charmin. Uh, Vanessa, it's going to be uh, square footage, really, that weights the most heavily. So price per square foot or adjusted price per square foot is really where you're going to focus, all right? Um, the number price per square foot comes from the sales price. So it's just a, a matter of taking the actual sales price and dividing it by the square footage of the home to get these adjusted and or square foot, price per square foot numbers. Then if you take this, in my case, $111, i get a calculator because I can't do that in my head. Um, I didn't do that homework before. He had 1,660 square feet, and you multiply that times the $111.22, and that gives you an average suggested list price of $184,625. And just like cents if you want to fill in the change. All right, so that's my starting point. That's my average suggested list price. Now let's think, I know, again, y'all didn't see all of the details on all my comps, but I did mention they're all more updated than Mr. Drew's. So now I have an average. The top half of that scale, however high it ends up going, which we'll do here in a second, 
he can't get on that top half of that range, right? He is not updated. So he's automatically going to fall in the lower half of this range just because of the condition of his property, all right? But where I'm starting, that midpoint, that average suggested list price is 184,625, right? So moving on up to the next mathematical equation that I would do, I'll write that number down so I can remember that in a moment. So looking at my sale price to list price ratio, or SPLP percent, it's the upper right column. Again, focusing just on the solds, not on my actives. Sorry, I'm trying to make it big enough you can see, but not take over the whole page. There we go. So again, average is where I focus. I'm going to be on this average number. So looking at that number. So what the, the goal that they wanted to achieve when they listed something, how much of that list price did they hope to achieve when they sold the home? Again, ignoring current market conditions right now, let's just say 100 for easy math, right? You listed it at X and you wanted to get 100% of that number when it sold, right? We're hoping that our seller is able to achieve selling it at list price. That was the ultimate goal. In this case, based on the comps that I painstakingly chose, they're saying they were on average able to achieve 95.04%. So just a little under list. And in a lot of markets nowadays, again, that's not going to be the case. They're achieving um, over by a good percent. But I wanted to pick some that'll do um, easy math, give us some easy math. And every market's different. And a, a market, quote unquote, is just whatever geographic parameter you used. So that could be that subdivision that's just a pocket of a few listings or a whole um, big space you drew on the map or something like that. If you were to do uh, like Cinco Ranch, that's a subdivision, uh, technically, I think. But gosh, there's so, so many sections of uh, Cinco, hundreds of sections of Cinco Ranch. So uh, that little market compared to Oak Ridge over here is hugely different. All right. So again, these numbers will be very different every time you run a CMA, uh, depending on what you put in as your parameter to choose your comps. All right. So the next mathematical equation I would do is the 100% I hoped to get minus the 95.04% that that market actually did get on average. And that would give me a 4.96% swing. That's my variance in that market. So going back to my first number, the one hundred and almost eighty-five thousand dollars, one eighty-four six twenty-five, I could go above that by four point nine percent, six percent, and below that by four point nine percent, six, below that by four point nine six percent, and that gives me my low and my high range. All right. Again, Mr. Drew's going to live in this lower half of the range because his condition was lesser compared to those comps that I chose, all right? Now, can Mr. Drew ever get up into the top half of that range? Only if he makes updates or upgrades to his home, right? Again, apples, red apples and green apples, they're all the same shape, size, age, geographic, the lot size is the same. Mr. Drew's not up to date, these others are all up to date, all right? So I did as close as possible as I could in characteristic and geography, and we just have some you know, red apples compared to my green apple of subject property. Hopefully that's making sense to you guys, all right? So again, I did the 100% that they hoped to achieve minus this, excuse me, the 95.04, the average sale price to list price ratio. So 100 minus 95.04 gave me a 4.96 range or variance in that, right? And then where I got my average suggested list price to go above and below with that 4.96% is this sales price per square foot times the actual square footage of my subject property. So I multiplied this number times 1660, which was the subject property of the property on the uh, crossbow. All right. Again, I know there's not a lot of visuals on that, so if you want to email me and ask me for it, I can shoot you a little Word document or something 
and help you with that. I'll put my email into the chat again, and I'll show it at the end of the webinar again. In case you didn't catch it, though, there's my email in the chat if you need to do that. What do you do if you're the biggest home in the subdivisions and all homes are smaller? So obviously you're gonna be on the high end of the range, but you might even go outside that range, right? Because you're what I call the unicorn. Uh, Elizabeth, sorry, um, your question. Um, we're guessing, right? If you still do this sales price per square foot, we're guessing where your subject will sell because there isn't anything like it is what I meant by we're guessing. But if you do the same equation, sales price per square foot, or the adjusted sale price per square foot, whichever it is the market told you you needed to use. If you do sales price per square foot times the actual square footage of your home, you're gonna get that average list price, but it's based on the actual square feet you have. So it'll be in coming, it'll come out to be a bit higher than what everything else is listed for just based on the fact that it has more square feet, right? Again, feel free to email if you need some help specifically on um, some CMAs. Again, I can't do your CMA for you, but I'm glad to look at it after you do your math. If you have questions or you want suggestions on comps or things like that that you chose, I'll do my best. All right, Edna, if you will just email me and ask me for it, I won't have access to the chat after the, the webinar ends. So if you'll just email me and ask, I'll be uh, glad to send it. And thank you, sorry, it switched to panelists only. So let me put my email back in there. Thank you so much for letting me know that. It didn't come through to you guys. So it's just my first name, Marilyn at har.com. All right, we also offer a class called CMA Price It Right. And let me just pull that page up real quickly for you guys. If you visit har.com slash edu, like education, you can also write out the whole word education if you want to do that. And just start typing the word CMA or the term CMA there. You'll see the CMA price it right. We have it in both English and Spanish. We also have another course called the Pricing Strategy Advisor. The PSA is actually a certification. This is an all day course from uh, usually nine to four. And at the end, you earn the PSA designation or certification. So that goes into much more detail on mastering the CMA, picking your comps and things like that. The CMA Price It Right class in both English and Spanish is a three hour course. And it'll be um, what I'm doing in this overview today, but just in a bit more detail. The next one of those classes that we're offering is coming up on the 12th, which is next Wednesday. So if that's of interest to you guys, that's another choice for you, all right? And again, har.com forward slash edu is where you can go to find those classes. Um, and Emily, good question. I won't be able to do it in the overview today, but the process would be about the same if you just simply go to the search for lots instead. You're not going to be putting in bedrooms, bathrooms, property square footage naturally, but you're looking uh, again about, about the same process. You're going to be, pardon me, looking for a lot that's about the same square footage. Age of, again doesn't factor in, so just really lot square footage and uh, geography would be uh, the two most important factors there. And you'll get the price per square foot of the empty lot as well, so you can do some of the same mathematical equations that we're doing with this home. All right. All right. So again, looking at the quick CMA, this is a perfectly fine report to give to a consumer. Like I said at the beginning of opening that CMA report, uh, it's two pages. You can print it front and back if that's what you want to do. Um, but um, if you can't educatedly talk about this, if you can't kind of, uh, you know, talk about that math or do, uh, say the math out loud just by having this one piece of paper, maybe have some notes, print yourself a copy of this where you wrote out the mathematical equations and give them a copy that's clean with no writing on it, um, just so that you have it. It may not be detailed enough. You have to kind of know your target audience, right? Unfortunately, sometimes we don't know them. Sometimes it was just a random phone call that I got or a CMA request from my website or something. I don't know their personality. I don't know if they want the unicorns and rainbows, as I call it, of charts and graphs and photos of the other comp. So maybe print this and have it on, uh, you know, in front of you to discuss things, but print them the fluffier one. And then you can always take out pages and just get rid of things that you don't need once you get in front of that consumer. If they're just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you just tell me about the math? I don't need all this stuff. I don't need your supporting documentation. Just tell me why and what. That's what I called you here for. 
then you can just swap it out. Give them the quick CMA or pull some of those pages out. We'll show the CMA wizard next. So you'll have a pricing page and a summary page that looks almost exactly like this in the uh, CMA wizard, All right? So going back to my results, also down at the very bottom is, it just says CMA, it's technically called the CMA wizard. That's the one that I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. We'll have like 20 some pages to it, some charts and graphs, photos of subject properties that it's pulling from MLS, All right? Um, will this be able to see Elizabeth? Uh, I presume that you're asking about if the webinar is recorded. Forgive me if I'm not understanding your question correctly. Just expand on it in the chat for me. Uh, I am recording the webinar and we'll post it on our YouTube channel and I will email it, uh, anyone who registered for the webinar once that um, posts. So y'all will know once it goes live. Great. Thank you so much. I'm glad I guessed the right question there. My brain's a little uh, foggy sometimes. All right. Uh, any Quick scenarios where you may use more than the three. Are you asking about three comps? Um, sorry, the chat jumped, so I lost track of the question. Uh, Sharva, three comps, was that your question there? Yes, okay. And it, it, the more the the more support that you have for making your choice, the better. Uh, again, NAR's recommendation was to try to find three active, three of some sort of pending, and three solds. Again, use one solid comp if that's all that you can find. Just really just one home that's right and everything else just doesn't really fit the bill. Then you may some days end up using fewer than three. And if you have five, let's say, that's sold and they're all, you know, the same floor plan, the same everything, just great, fabulous, fabulous amazing comps, go for it. Yeah, it's fine to have more support for the numbers that you have. Just be really sure that you're picking them based on as similar as possible to the subject, not just trying to get some number of solds, but they really do have all the characteristics of the, the subject as well. All right. All right. Let's see. It looks like we've I pretty much caught up on my questions in the chat. Sorry, every time somebody answers a chat, features another chat, it jumps to the bottom to the most recent one. So, all right. And again, I'm recording the webinar. We're going to post it to our YouTube channel, and anybody that registered will be emailed once the video is done and posted. So you'll know about that. It usually just takes a couple of days for it to post. Um, sometimes I get lucky, and she's able to post it right away. All right. So. I will definitely send you a message and let you know once it's ready to go though. All right, so let's go into the CMA real quickly. Again, it's pulling whatever I painstakingly chose as my comps, so I don't have to do all that work again, the, just the properties I had checked. The little drop down here to select the contact name, if they're already in my address book or contact list in matrix, I can just pick them from the list. If they're not, I can add them here, so I don't have to have added them first necessarily. And then if I wanted to describe this further, I certainly could. It's not required, so you don't have to put something there. You could put in the description something like what a CMA is or why you chose what comps you chose, kind of in a you know Cliff Notes type summary of why you chose what you did, um, and or that his home is not very competitive with the market because they're all updated and he's not. Word those things very diplomatically and or, again, leave it blank. Talk about it, but maybe don't put it in writing. Up to you, All right? So clicking on the next step here, pages. Mine looks a little different than yours. Yours will look like this initially. Anything on the left is what you have as an option to include in the CMA, and anything you move over to the right will be what you have chosen to use in your CMA. If you click on the little plus next to each of those kind of section headers, you'll see all of the pages within that section. Again, there's 20 some pages, 27, 28, something like that pages to their template. You don't necessarily need them all, but you also don't know what you don't know at this stage. If you've never used this, you've never seen those pages. So you need to at least look at them. Uh, looking at cover, cover sheets or cover with a photo, it, you have to look at it to see the difference. So I'm gonna put them both over there on the right. Cover with a photo doesn't refer to the property photo. It actually refers to the background image that's on the cover sheet. So 
Again, I'm going to pick them both so I can kind of preview it for you. If you go down into the subject and adjustments pages, clearly you don't need anything related to townhomes or lots or multifamily, uh, excuse me, mid high rise, because that's not the kind of property I worked with. My house subject property was a single family property, so I don't need to choose the others. Again, how to guesstimate what you do and don't need at this stage. If you click the section header, like I'm just going to click on static, it automatically puts all those pages from that section over there. So then I can go and preview those in a moment. I can come back to this pages step at any time and click on the name of a page and click the little X over here on the right to get rid of that page. So as I preview it, if I go through there and I think, mm, I don't really care for that minimums maximum page, I can just click the little X and get rid of it. And then moving on to the next step about your subject property, you can import that from a tax ID or from an MLS number. Remember earlier, we pulled the property up in tax. So we would have the tax ID for that property on this page. We could also go to the last known MLS listing and get the MLS number for that property from there. So again, it's that pretty simple to just pop in there and pull up. Click fill. Oops, we'll pull that property up. And to use it as our subject property. If it were in MLS before, it's going to use the primary photo from MLS. So again, here we're seeing our beautiful vintage kitchen. Uh, but all the cookie cutter facts about the house have populated as well. So I don't have to manually enter all that stuff. That is an option if you choose to manually enter all the um, features of the uh, subject property. You can do that. I think importing it is a little easier. Cover, again, this is just going to show me what's going to be on the cover, the subject property photo that imported from that MLS. If I have another picture, maybe I drove by and snapped a photo with my cell phone or something, I can browse and upload and replace that MLS photo if I want to do that. The owner's name as it pulled in from my contact list a moment ago and or just manually enter that info. And then my information, which comes from my profile in the matrix system, I'll try to fit that in at the end of this webinar. Uh, if you hadn't already configured that, I'll show you where you can go to configure that, but you can also just edit it on the fly right here. If you don't already have it in there, you could upload your photo, change out your contact info and stuff by using the edit option, All right? Moving into the comps, again, it's using whatever comparables I already painstakingly chose from MLS. So I don't need to do anything really on this step. If you wanted to add other listings in from MLS and supplement your comps and pick and choose different ones, you can, but I would recommend doing all of that legwork up front. Moving on into map then, again, really nothing to do. It's just basically showing you your subject and all the comps that you chose on a map, and that'll print for the consumer. Any adjustments that are necessary, you do have to do the math. On the quick CMA, it did the math for us, but in this CMA, I'd have to do the math on those. Again, I didn't have any, but if we click the property address to view the details, scroll down about halfway and you'll see, or a little more than halfway, you'll see that closing costs and repairs per seller. Again, if I had had any numbers on my comparable property in the right-hand column, pretending that said 4,000, I would come to this box and type minus, 4,000 because they had to give away $4,000 in repairs or closing costs to make that happen. Again, you don't need to adjust for anything. Um, if it's not a major trend in the market, if the great majority of all your sold properties did not have adjustments, then it was just something unique to that particular scenario with that one buyer and seller. You don't really need to do any adjusting. Again, in my case, I didn't have any adjustments. No solds had them at all. So I'm not going to worry about this page either. Uh, if you click this view in single line mode, it takes you back to uh, this view where I clicked the uh, address of the property. Again, view it on all the properties. If you had adjustments on all of those, just click next to go on to the next. Let me pause here just a moment. I see that there are quite a few questions in the chat there. All right, I have a client that wants to list on the MLS when they bought it shows the square footage. So MLS and uh, appraisal district square footage being different. Um, 
I would go with what's in the appraisal district unless your seller, Patricia, has some way to prove uh, what their square footage is. Like when they did that work to convert the attic, did they get permits and all of that good stuff? Do they have an appraisal? Uh, maybe you uh, need to order an appraisal to get the actual square footage of the home so that there's no question later about what that might, uh, what that, the, the right one of those three numbers might be, right? Otherwise, again, I'd lead towards um, appraisal district. All right, and I put the address to the YouTube channel in the chat a little earlier. Sorry if I missed your question before I did that. Um, is, the place, is there a place to see the name of the builder? Sometimes, um, if that's relevant information in the MLS, there is a place for builder name if the listing agent put it in there. Sometimes the listing agent puts it in and sometimes they don't. So there is a field for that, Edna, just whether they filled it in or not is, is um, subject to the listing agent having, having put that in there. Uh, and again, Vanessa, on the comps, I would uh, steer away from using the radius and use polygon or some of those uh, result, I mean, um, geographical criteria like subdivision market area, zip codes, and then draw on the map with a polygon to stay a little bit tighter uh, before I used the circle. And then the max that a um, an appraiser can go out is two and a half miles with that circle. So you can kind of creep out from a half a mile to a mile to no further than two and a half if you do choose to use the circle or find that you need to because you tried everything else first, All right? And then is there an average uh, adjustment cheat sheet? Uh, not that HAR provides, not generally speaking. Uh, go to an appraiser, you could go to an inspector, go to your broker or managers first. They may have some sort of um, checklist of, you know, a kitchen uh, uh, renovation adds X dollars or might cost this much or, you know, whatever. Uh, start with your office first, your brokers and managers. If they have something like that, then that would be a great resource. But then again, maybe you could go to like an appraiser um, or inspector. They're, inspectors are allowed to adjust for things like, um, you know, kitchen upgrades and, and countertops and, you know, stuff like that, whereas a realtor can't really. So you want to be really mindful of not doing too many adjustments outside the scope of your license. But again, an inspector or an appraisal could tell you like, a kitchen over um, renovation might add X dollars in a certain market, All right? And youtube.com slash H-A-R-T-V. Again, is the YouTube channel. I'll, I'll put it in the chat there in case it didn't pop up. Maybe I sent it only to panelists earlier instead of attendees as well. So there is the uh, YouTube address again in the chat. All right, uh, moving into the pricing tab of the CMA wizard. Again, it's going to show me my adjusted as well as my um, average comps. They're the same in my case because there were no adjustments. Moving on down, additional analysis um, just talks about pricing and stats. Once we fill in the blanks, the suggested list price is for you to type in there. You can type that low and high range that we talked about. In Mr. Drew's case, I probably would do the low up to the average, and that's as much as I would share with him because, again, he can't do orange range. He can only stay down here in apple range, so I would put those numbers. Some agents don't like to fill in that box because once you put numbers there, uh, you might have to talk them out of certain numbers, right? If I threw out 185000 almost, then Mr. Drew's going to be great. Let's list it at 185,000, right? But he probably can't achieve that given his condition compared to everybody else in the market, or he might have difficulty achieving that. Again, given that everything's so crazy right now, he could very well achieve at least 185 and or surpass that just simply because inventory is so low and folks are clamoring for um, a home to buy. Also in the box, you could put something like, we will discuss this together in person, right? So I could put something in the box, but just not put numbers, right? And then it will display math for me once I generate the report and print it out. There's a spot here for notes up to a thousand characters. Again, you can leave it blank if that's what you wanna do. Be really mindful of whatever you put in writing. My uncle is a real estate lawyer, so you know everything in writing can be used later against you in a court of law, kind of goes through my mind. but you don't want to put anything in writing that would be um, capable of being misconstrued by a, a, the potential seller, right? 
or promises that you can't fulfill. So again, maybe the notes would be why you chose certain comps or just an overview of what characteristics you use or what criteria you use to choose comps. Again, you can leave it blank. You don't have to put anything in that note section either. And then lastly, we go to finish. And then we can view the CMA in the upper left area there. Click on view and it'll generate a PDF. So this is my chance to review it so I can see A, what the heck it's going to look like, and then B, what pages would be uh, relevant and kept within my CMA. It's going to take it a few moments to generate because, again, it's got like 20 some pages to the CMA. All right, so 34 total. I've got a couple of extra pages in there that I don't need, but 34 pages to the CMA. Again, know your target audience. 34 is an awful lot of pages, unless I'm that type of person who really needs the unicorns and rainbows. I need lots of pages to help support those numbers. Math is not my strong suit, so seeing a lot of tangible um, evidence, for lack of a better term, of why you did what you did, why you're telling me what you're telling me, is gonna be really helpful to me then this might work, right? Again, looking at cover sheet here versus cover with a photo. Again, it's the design, the theme of that kind of navy border and um, the header title of the page with that kind of watermark of a floor plan in the background. That's what they meant by cover with a photo. This is with a photo and this one is just cover sheet. So it has nothing to do with the property photo as one might deduce or um, guess at when you're first, excuse me, when you're first putting the CMA together. And then the second page here, this uh, summary, again, looks almost exactly like the quick CMA that we did a moment ago. So that's gonna give you uh, the same overview information, your um, adjusted sale price, so that one could be used instead of or in addition to the quick CMA. Uh, someone's asking why the property photo is so small because that's what the listing agent put in there. The resolution that they used to upload that photo was just a really low resolution picture. Usually it fits the whole box, but we're at the mercy of the listing agent on this one. So it used what it had in MLS. Again, if you had your own photo that you could upload, it could be a better quality, a higher resolution photo and it would fill that white box. All right, thank you, good questions, y'all. All right, so continuing on through, don't worry, I'm not going to read all 34 pages of this. So here you can see a little better what it looks like if you have a higher resolution, better quality photo. It fills the box almost completely, right? The left column is all about my subject and then what it pulled in from MLS about the comps that I painstakingly chose. And it does all your actives first and then the pendings and then the solds. So they're in order by status and there's several different pages. Again, if this would be a benefit to, to the consumer, great. If not, don't include it, right? Uh, the minimums and maximums page I uh, talked about just briefly earlier. This is one, I'm not actually allowed to advise you what pages to include or what not to include. Go to your broker, talk to your managers, team leaders, um, and get some advice if you need some advice on that. Commonsensically, if you look through those pages, you can probably determine very easily on your own what does help support your CMA efforts and what does not. Um, this page, if we look at it, the summary, as it calls it, uh, the listing price between $179,000 and $250,000. If we again think about Mr. Drew not being able to go any higher than $184,629, and this page talks about 250. If we think that through, the way it words that listing price between makes me feel like if I'm a consumer, you're telling me I should list my home somewhere between 179 and 250. So I might naturally choose 250, right? But what it's saying is of all of the comps that I found and used, the lowest was 179 and the highest was 250. But when they sold the lowest sales price was 165 and the highest was 215. So again, looking at these numbers, you can see where maybe possibly those might get a little difficult to explain away. So you might wanna leave this one out. Remember, if you go back to your CMA wizard where you're building it, go to pages, click the name of the page and the X to get rid of that page. So. 
Again, if these numbers in, in your scenario come out to make more sense and uh, don't have such a wide gap between them, maybe it works fine for one CMA. It just doesn't work fine for this CMA, all right? Again, charts and graphs and uh, all sorts of um, supporting information for wh what comp you did pick and sort of helping educate them as to why you picked it. Like I said, I'm not going to take you through all 34 pages. I will just say the last pages in that static section, your activity versus timing, my guarantee to you. Again, if you're not going to do what this guarantee says, um, then leave that page out. It's an uneditable page. Static means it's the same no matter which CMA you run. So it's going to have um, um, activity versus timing. The longer a house sits on the market, the, the interest in it tends to wane and drop off. That's true of every house pretty much all over everywhere. It's a static, uneditable page, and it's not specific to your market. It's just showing you, generally speaking, in real estate, there's a lot of interest in the beginning, and then that drops off as the home tends to stay. So again, do your due diligence, go through and look at all of those pages, take out what you don't want, leave in what you do want, and then you can close, view the CMA again, to print it with the new set of pages for having removed what you pulled out already, right? So that is our CMA wizard. In the last few minutes, we'll talk quickly about the instant CMA and uh, cloud CMA. I'm just gonna go back to my results. If you aren't already familiar with it, this recent searches in the upper right corner can sometimes come in really handy. I don't wanna have to click the back arrow a bunch of times to get all the way back to where my results were. So I'm gonna click on recent searches. And then the most recent search that I did, which was this one, will load as soon as I click it. So it takes me back to where I left off before I started the CMA wizard. It left all my properties checked. So I can just quickly move into doing the next CMA. Again, if you're not familiar with that recent searches button, I call it my parachute button. Um, I can just parachute back into whichever, jump back into, whichever report that I needed to where I left off. So something I did yesterday or the day before or, you know, a week ago, whatever it might be, is I'm going to be in that recent searches, All right? So a little side note, little extra matrix bonus content for you guys. So now looking down toward the bottom cloud CMA, I mentioned also at the beginning that this is something that is specific to those that are subscribed to the Platinum package of tools. So if you're not subscribed to Platinum, once you click on it, we'll say that you need to subscribe to Platinum to be able to use that tool. It is like the CMA Wizard. It's a third-party company. Cloud CMA is its own company. So it's um, not the same, but it's really similar. And it's just, again, from that third party. It's going to automatically pull your comps from MLS based on whatever you checked here. It'll generate that CMA. Uh, I am an employee at HAR, so I don't really have access to it because I'm not officially an agent. I'm just a fake kind of sort of pretend agent. So I can do some of the things, but not all of the things. From this page, again, it's kind of like the CMA wizard. See, I've got these little stepping stones similar to what I was doing in Matrix a moment ago. I'll click the big green button to move on in the upper right there to move on to each of those steps. The client name is required. So here I'm just going to type in that client name. And then the Cloud CMA uses a national database, very similar to RPR, if you're familiar with that. Um, if I just start typing the subject property address, you'll see it's got several different suggestions for me. And the one in Spring, Texas is what I'll use, and it'll import that data. Under Advanced, I can type and fill in blanks if I need to, or change the square footage, the question that came up a little bit earlier. Um, about the uh, question of square footage. Again, if I don't want to use what it pulled from a tax record, I could just simply change that number, all right? And then looking down here, again, it's importing all the MLS numbers of those that I have checked in matrix automatically. Uh, I do wish they would call this something a little different, but what they call it is quick and dirty. You can just go into Cloud CMA um, without having done the search in MLS and do a quick version of their CMA, get at least 10 all the way up to 50 comps going a year back or 18 months or whatever it is you want to do. Again, three to six months is typically what I suggest. And then filling in the blanks with bedroom count, square footage, range, list price, and build your search that way and do the search within cloud. Again, I typically do the search in matrix. 
we're all very familiar with matrix or are familiar on some level with matrix so i think it's just a little easier to do the search and the painstaking review and selection of comps in matrix because you're already mostly familiar with that so, and then you would click on fetch listings in the upper right corner again it'll take you through reviewing your comps customizing the report you can change the font the color of the font the layouts of different pages again they have like 50 eight, I think it is, or 55 pages to their template. I'm not able to show it just simply because I'm not a member, uh, really. I'm not an agent, really, but I'll show you the finished product. Um, it's just a matter of uh, clicking the buttons in the upper right corner of each of those pages and then publishing the report. Once you publish the report, again, it's going to look a lot like um, one that we uh, got from the CMA wizard a moment ago. And I apologize that I can't show you the steps, but I'll show you uh, the finished product, like I said, so here's the cover of theirs. It comes with a little letter. You can edit that letter. Again, if I don't talk like that, I don't want to say that stuff. If it promises things I'm not going to do, I don't want to give them that letter. You can take out the letter completely or you can edit it and change it up. Again, a stock or static page just, to, just describing what a CMA is. Your contact info based on your information as it pulled from. MLS into cloud CMA when you built that. Maps of the comps in the subject. My comps are a little different in the CMA because I created it previously. Again, summary page, sorry, let me go back. Similar to our quick CMA, columnar comparisons, three up per comp, a page that's got all of the property photos if that's what you choose. So again, really customizable. I picked all the property photos. So it's a much more detailed um, end result potentially because of that. Um, again, just depending on what color scheme that you want, there's some branded themes in there. I think um, Holwell Banker and Keller Williams, I believe, have branded themes which in, within the cloud CMA product. So um, potentially you'll have the ability to customize with that. Cloud CMA is going to provide their own training. So in um, we don't have courses on uh, cloud for that reason. Uh, but if you visit the cloudcma.com, they have webinars that are live, they have pre-recorded, they have a good help section, um, some little tutorial videos that are pre-recorded that run a minute and a half-ish, two-ish minutes, something like that. So cloudcma.com will get you to their page and get you support and extra training on that product as well. All right. Um, let me check the chat here real quickly and then we'll wrap up with our instant CMA before the webinar ends at 1.30 in the last few minutes here. Um, again, um, a question about using actives in the CMA. As I mentioned a couple of times, you can use actives if, if you want. They do show you what your current competition is. Some don't and that's okay. Um, I use them because that is my current competition in that market. And that's gonna be my competition with, with buyers right now. If they're the same shape, size, age, and condition, well, then the buyers are going to look at all three, right? If mine is in lesser condition, they may skip over mine just because it would need some work or something like that. So using those actives can kind of illustrate that point and um, show, you what, show the seller what their current competition is. Again, the webinar is being recorded and you'll all get an email uh, with the link to that once it's posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, and then Grace, if the home has an apartment on the back of the house, like a mother-in-law street suite, that kind of thing, um, it's not going to be included usually in the square footage, but it would be something that I would try to find a comp for. I would try to find a comp that also has that extra living space. General rule of thumb is if it's not connected to the main home, if it doesn't have air conditioning and you can't walk directly to it from the, the air AC and the walking path isn't directly connected to the main living space, the main dwelling, then it's not counted in that square footage. Usually it's just bonus square footage. All right. Uh, that's coming up an awful lot now uh, for some reason as well. A mother-in-law suite or additional living space, uh, like a garage apartment, things like that. So just look for other listings that have that same kind of bonus square footage is what I would do. All right. Um, and Debbie, that QR code on the cloud CMA, it automatically generates that. It's just a part of the cloud system. So that published CMA would automatically have that on there for you based on your contact information. Well, excuse me, based on your using, I looked at my contact information on that page, based on you using uh, Cloud CMA, it creates a, a unique UR code for each CMA. 
the agent leading the way. All right, so backing up now to matrix, just to finish out instant CMA real quickly. And I'm gonna use that trick that I talked about a little earlier. I'm gonna hover on search and then single family, and I'm gonna right click, click single family just so I can show you from scratch and I don't lose my work in case you'll have some questions where I need to go back to comps or something a little bit later. I'm gonna uncheck the status because I wanna pull up my subject property and see if there are any previous MLS listings for that property. The instant CMA is accessible from the full detail report on a property. So again, just pretending that I'm doing a CMA for estimate of or suggested list price range. I'm gonna come down here to street address and put in 310 crossbow. And the reason I did not select any status is because I may not know when that property sold. If I check sold, it's only going back six months. And so I won't find it because this house did not sell in the last six months. It sold years ago. And instead of having to guess at that, if you uncheck all your statuses, it finds that subject property by address regardless of any time frame. all right? So then if I click on results, here is that old sold listing. Again, I think it was 06 when it sold. And if I click the MLS number, here's my full detail page where I can see my room sizes, previous photos, all of that stuff that we looked at way back at the beginning. But kind of hiding in plain sight over the property photo, this little blue icon is the instant CMA. So if you click that blue icon, it's gonna presume that Crossbow is your subject property of your listing. And then it'll help you build a CMA based on other comps within the MLS system. So I'll click Instant CMA. Oh, of course, it's going to help funny today. Usually, it would show me actives, pendings, and solds. Let's go back to our results. Good thing I left them open. I didn't practice this before, and it did work. So let's just try this. Click on an ML number. Click on the CMA icon. All right, looks like it's gonna be happy with that. I've it on solds before, so I don't know why it doesn't wanna to work today, but I'm just gonna squeeze this one in real quick in the last few minutes, so I'll use this one. So across the top here, we're in our solds. It's found 20 for me based on some really loose generic criteria. The most important thing of the instant CMA is to always go up here to refine criteria in the upper right corner. It hasn't taken into account a sold date that's less than a year. Again, that's generally not what we wanna do. We wanna to stick to the three to six months range. So you can slide that and make that make more sense. Uh, back at my, oops, excuse me, my location, it used a mile and a half radius around the subject. Again, I may wanna switch that to be in the same subject property or in the zip code, or again, go and draw on the map, much like we did in matrix before. Click on start drawing. And it's going to be like a freehand polygon. So you can just kind of do your best to follow those major thoroughfares and then use this shape. All right. So again, several different options there just based on whatever you do in that section. Uh, list price. Again, it's doing a 20% swing above and below. It's not really using the math of list price. It's what has sold that it uses. Uh, square feet, again, it didn't use any square footage in terms of um, being near the subject property. Again, you can swing up and down above and below your subject by 250, 500, all the way up to 2,000 square feet. No real wrong answer there. The smaller the swing, the tighter um, or smaller your list of comps is going to be. The bigger the swing, the more comps you might get to look at. And then you have the ability to just choose whatever is appropriate within that range, right? You're built, again, it doesn't take that into account at all. So you need to slide that and make sure that makes more sense in terms of where to search. And then property type for sale is what we wanna look at, not homes for lease. We're not trying to guesstimate a leased price. We're trying to guesstimate a list price range for something that will be for sale. Again, it doesn't factor stories by default, uh, bedrooms or pool, so really, really important that you um, refine that criteria and make that make sense. Do as I say, not as I do. I'm just going to hit cancel. Since I haven't done a CMA with this particular property, I just want to be really sure that I have plenty of comps to choose from. So looking at my solds, again, I can click the address 
and read through all the details, see the pictures, read the remarks and descriptions, room sizes, all of that stuff from HAR.com. If it's a comp that I think is amazing and wonderful, I can just click on the little plus over here. The instant CMA requires that you choose at least two solds. Again, forgive me, I'm just picking things randomly to try to end this on time and get us out of here. So focus on functionality rather than my um, selection. In real life, please painstakingly choose only comps that make sense, that are the most um, appropriate shape, size, age. Again, the minimum to use the instant CMA process is two solds, pick two, three, four, five, whatever is appropriate, and then move on to the next step by clicking next in the lower right corner. Do that exact same process with your pendings. There's no requirement for the number of pendings or actives that you have to pick. Again, I'm just going to randomly pick a couple here to move us through to the next step. But in real life, please, please painstakingly read over those. So now I've got my average sale, average square footage, price per square foot. I can add adjustments. So again, if I happen to know they gave away $4,000 for closing costs on one of those properties. We could do something like that if I wanted. And then next, who it's prepared for, and then create. I'm making this take much longer than it usually does in real life. I'll probably set aside a good hour to build a CMA because you have to take all that time to painstakingly read through and research what comps that you choose. Um, but creating the CMA from the quick or the instant CMA process is just a matter of a couple of clicks, as you can see. The instant CMA, again, requires that you do a little more searching and research. So that may take you uh, longer uh, for that reason. But generating the output is pretty quick in both of those. Again, the CMA wizard requires that you do a lot of research up front and then generating the report to just take a couple of extra minutes above and beyond that. So once it's done, you can click on view CMA report to view it. So you can see it's just an on-screen columnar comparison, a little summary at the top there, and then kind of an overview of market conditions and third-party guesstimates of market valuations. Right. If you like that report, you can download it and save it as a PDF. You can also email it directly to your client with the share option there. It does give you the ability to share these things out on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. I don't know why you would do that, but you could. Um, perhaps if this was my listing and I'm trying to do some sort of report that shows why I've chosen the list price I've chosen, kind of a support of my own math, maybe. That's why I would put that on social media. Um, again, my humble personal opinion, I don't know that you would do that all that often, but there may be a, a scenario where you would. All right. I made it just under the wire, three extra minutes of your life spent with me on this webinar. I do hope that you learned something uh, helpful today. Um, again, we did record the whole thing. It'll be on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash HARTV, but I will email all of you that registered for this webinar just to let you know that it is posted. So give it a couple of days to go live and we will have that on there for you. If you have any extra uh, questions you wanna throw into the chat real quickly, feel free to do that. I'll be glad to stay on a few more moments if anybody needs me to answer something. Just an overview of what I went through today. Beyond that, feel free to email or call. I am glad to help in any way that I can. Again, that's what I do for a living. So. Um, if I can help, let me know. Uh, Maria, if you could just clarify which website that you need again, I'll be glad to put that in there. So thank you all so much. You are free to leave this session if you'd like. Again, if you've got any questions, just shoot me an email and let me know that. I really appreciate your time today. I know some of you uh, registered um, very recently, and I really appreciate that. I'm glad I was able to get a pop-up into Matrix today and have so many extra folks be able to join me. Um, yes, thank you for clarifying, Maria. YouTube.com slash HARTV will be our YouTube channel. And again, that'll be included in the email that I sent you. Send you in the next couple of days once the, the uh, recording goes live.
All right, wonderful. Thank you again so much for your time and attention and your great questions and interaction during the webinar. Everybody have a great day and a great weekend. Have a great one. Thank you again. Bye-bye.